My name is Ned, and I have been married to Robin for six years. We have a two- and a four-year-old. Robin stays at home with the children. They have me absolutely wrapped around their little fingers. Just hearing them say, Daddy, melts my heart. I am generally the forceful kind. But with Robin, I usually defer to her. Equally powerful personality. However, around her friends and family, I come across as meek and easygoing. I'm not one to cause issues. It's bad that individuals want to stereotype others. This relationship extends into the bedroom where Robin usually sets the agenda for our nights. Don't get me wrong, we both adore intimacy, and I'm not complaining. But recently, things changed. Just six weeks ago, I felt normal and sane. I now look in the mirror and feel like a different person. Perhaps I will wind up in jail. Maybe I won't even get charged. All I'm doing is putting a couple of scammers in a difficult situation. And curiously enough, I have the impression that I am fulfilling my wife's requests, albeit in a rather non-stop, regimented manner. But I don't care about her opinion. I'm a muscular guy that works out regularly. I can easily lift pound 200, possibly more if I push myself. But I don't want to damage my back while carrying Spencer on my shoulders. I was grateful for my good fitness level. He squirmed and struggled until I clamped his nose closed and taped his lips shut, effectively cutting off his oxygen. I calmly informed him that if he continued to misbehave, I would continue to hold his nose. Spencer got quite docile after that, even with a miner's light on my forehead. I navigated in the darkness. The temperature shift was dramatic. Outside, it had been a warm summer night, but it was now cold and damp. The water droplets aid to calm off my hot body. This was more intense than a morning workout. I had to stop multiple times because this excursion took 30 minutes to finish. At each stance, I took note of the journey I had taken. When I arrived at my planned destination, I violently dropped Spencer to the ground. This is my opinion on males who interfere with other men's spouses. Spencer attempted to conceal his flaws, but it was ineffective. Anger erupted. I couldn't bear it and swung my leg several times. I felt like the Hulk. Spencer was in tears after drinking my water bottle. I retraced my ways to locate Robin. I carefully counted each stride. My clothing clung to me, soaked in a mix of water and sweat, as I remembered that I needed to navigate both out and back. Spencer, who previously lived a few doors down from me, is Robin's partner. I hope it turns into a soon. I'll make every attempt to do so. I stumbled onto this information by chance because it appears that I have been duped for a long time. They laughed at me behind my back. This is an insult to all men. When Spencer and his family moved in, a middle-aged guy purchased their home. Paul is a kind man, and I occasionally have a few of beers with him at his place, where Spencer used to live. So yet, there's been no cause to introduce him to Robin or my kids. He's a huge lover of baseball, something I've never been especially interested in. However, because Paul was an entertaining communicator, I didn't mind watching baseball with him. However, Approximately a month after moving in, Paul helped turn my life around. Ned, you will not believe what I've discovered. Behind the false wall in the laundry room lies a stockpile of DVDs. You should watch them, he urged. I am interested. Adult content? I asked. Yes, it appears that it is a hidden camera recording. There may have been around 60 DVDs in three years. This one appears to be the most recent. Taken only a week before I purchased the house, he responded. Paul inserted the disc, and the screen came to life. I took a sip of beer while seated on a bar stool. Although the camera angle was limited, it was evident that the man was Spencer, and the woman was the one I remembered from neighborhood events. I assume her name is Sandra, and she is most likely married. This clip delighted me because I witnessed my neighbor cheating on her spouse with another neighbor. I was not expecting such a scene. Do you know them? Paul inquired when he noticed my expression. Yes. This was the previous landlord. He is married, and this woman is not his wife. She's married to someone else from the area. I believe her name is Sandra. I responded, Let's see what else is on these DVDs, Paul said, shifting to another one. The phone rang, and Paul excused himself to answer the call. I wanted to scream just ten seconds after the new DVD was released. What the hell? Robin. My wife climbed onto the bed in her bathrobe. I watched in horror as my marriage crumbled in front of my eyes. Spencer appeared in the frame, and before going onto the bed, he took a short glance at the camera and smiled as if he was the only one filming the hall. What happened next was a true horror for me. 
My cheerful attitude suddenly dissipated. Instead, I felt a profound emptiness that was eclipsed by the anguish in my chest. My impulse to harm both of them has grown. Spencer finished and they lay side by side, laughing and talking. What's new about the cuckold? He asked my wife. This sad guy, I made him eat all of your cream pie. She spoke mockingly. Really? How did you do that? He asked. When I arrived home on Tuesday, Ned was in a terrific mood and definitely wanted something extra. And you know, I am a smart woman. After a few gentle adjustments, he's already eaten a pie, she said. I did my best to suppress my contempt. I assumed Robin had destroyed my love that day. What a dishonest dude. He and Spencer would face the consequences of their arrogance. Another blow followed. Spencer, do you know what I have been dreaming about? So we leave our lovers and live the rest of our lives together. I closed my eyes. I felt myself sinking into my own world. Paul's voice drew me back into reality. Are you all right, dude? He asked. Yes. It's only a minor headache, I said. Looking at the screen, I noticed that Robin and Spencer had already recovered sufficiently to begin the second race. I could not bear it and switched it off. I was fed up and informed Paul I was going. Before you go, Ned, do you identify her as Paul? Not really, just another woman next door. When was the film made? I inquired, trying to appear calm as possible. Two days before the first one I showed you, he responded coldly, attempting to conceal my rage. I said, well, at least it will save you money on adult movies. What a foolish girl. He cheated on his soulmate with everyone in the neighborhood, and she believes he is interested in her. I left Paul's house as gracefully and quickly as possible, and began walking. Returning home now would undoubtedly result in acts or words that I would later regret. On the other hand, by the time I arrived at my front door, I might have found just what I wanted. Darkness had swallowed not only the sky, but also my spirit. Robin was plainly upset and demanding. Where have you been? I replied without making direct eye contact. I'm not feeling good. I'm going to bed. I closed and locked the bedroom door. Robin's voice persisted. That does not solve my question. Where were you? Collapsing on the bed. I could hear the doorknob shaking. Open the door. I couldn't take it any longer, so I opened the door and snapped at her. Listen, find somewhere else to sleep tonight. Robin's eyes widened. Not so much in dread, more in disbelief. I slammed the door shut and returned to lie on the bed, regretting that my scream had woken the children. The quality of my sleep is debatable. Even when the sunlight crept through the slats, I felt weary. The hot shower helped little, but my legs remained weak because the kids were still sleeping. I moved silently. Robin was waiting for me in the kitchen, and I poured myself a cup of coffee before addressing her. I'm not sure what you think, but it was a disgrace to be called a disparaging slur. It's very unlike you, she said. Forget about it. You are a worthless and unfaithful person. I have watched the footage, I responded calmly. I'm not sure what video you're talking about. Someone else must be involved. She quickly began justifying herself. You are an ignorant and disgusting person. Spencer recorded all of your meetings on camera. I understand what I'm talking about and what I observed. I'm filing for divorce, I responded bitterly. Robin's response gradually shifted from blatant denial to angry anger, spoken with evil purpose. Spencer claims you cannot afford to divorce me. His brother is a lawyer, and he should be informed. I would have been awarded custody of the children, child support, and hefty maintenance. In addition, you would be responsible for housing me and the children. I have not denied you anything, so only your fragile ego is damaged. So what if I were in a relationship with Spencer who suffered from this? Only your useless ego. It honestly doesn't matter to me. Move on. I flipped my coffee cup over Robin's head and saw it smash into the distance. Fortunately, there were no windows nearby. Otherwise, my reaction would have had serious consequences. Robin raced out of the kitchen, slamming the bedroom door behind her and taking both her and my car keys. I left the house feeling aimless and frustrated, unsure of where I was heading. I was certain of one thing. I no longer wanted to remain where I was, disregarding Robin's calls. Instead, I was swamped with text messages. Why did you take my car keys? She said. Because I could. I responded, stop speaking and acting like a child. It means nothing. You are the one I love, she stated. I can do without your phony love. What I witnessed on the recordings will never leave my mind.
I said you would forget about it. Please come home, she implored. Damn hero, I refused to simply stroll past it. I accepted that I would not be able to keep it, but I took out all of the money from both our checking and savings accounts. It wasn't a lot of money, but I decided it was better for me than her. Looking up divorce rules in my state online just proved how faulty the system was. Living in a state with equal distribution rules meant that her infidelity was not taken seriously. I opted to postpone starting the divorce process. I couldn't afford to move out, so when I got home, it was empty. Robin's clothes were still present. I presume she obtained a spare set of car keys and went to see her mother, who lived about 30 miles away. Despite not having filed for divorce, I had no intention of living another day as a loving marriage with Robin. Our leased three-bedroom ranch house was fully filled, leaving one of us on the couch. Robin was not present, so she had no influence in who it would be. When she returns, she will find all of her clothes nicely arranged in the living room. That night, I was alone under the moonlight, with no trace of Robin or my children. It was just as well that ideas of vengeance against Robin persisted. Instead of wallowing, I took it upon myself to damage Robin's wedding dress with astonishing efficiency using box cutters. Our faithful paper shredder disposed of any leftover images of Robin. Perhaps my children will wonder why there are no cherished images of their mother, but I will always blame Robin's distaste to being photographed. Robin reappeared, but she did not stay long. She doesn't seem to appreciate the concept of sleeping on the couch, and I didn't see any other options for her. Spending time with the children truly improved my mood. How much longer will you play the martyr? She asked cynically. How much longer will you be promiscuous? I responded. Face it, Ned, it all began innocently. But after we crossed the line, he was better than you. And I will not give him up. Help me transfer my belongings back to the bedroom and perhaps you'll be lucky and I'll stay with you. However, it is unlikely she imposed a condition. I'd rather live alone than with you, a hypocritical and miserable girl. You are a bad person, Robin. My nerves were on edge when I uttered this. How about I simply divorce your moaning self? Is this what you want? I can easily locate someone else. Your children can call daddy. Think about it. You're going to give up your entire salary while another guy enjoys my companionship and your children. So stop it or I will do exactly that. She began blackmailing me when I blocked her access into our bedroom. She made an outraged and angry face, grabbed the children and went. A few days later, Robin and the kids came home. Robin seemed perplexed. I was sleeping in my bed and Robin would lie down beside me. I shove her to the floor every time she attempts to snuggle up to me. Listen, Ned, if you don't start carrying out your responsibilities as a spouse, including closeness in bed with me, I'll start bringing men home. Is that what you want? You want to sit there and watch as a real man meets my feminine needs? Do you need that? Believe me, I can easily arrange this, she stated. And I couldn't believe this was coming from a man with whom I'd shared a home for many years. I grasped Robin's tightly curled hair in my fist and drew her closer until her face was mere inches from mine. If you dare to do this with another man in front of my children, both of you will face the repercussions. Do you understand, scoundrel? In the midst of the chaos, Robin's eyes filled with terror for the first time. However, she couldn't resist challenging me as she dashed down the hallway, slamming the bedroom door behind her. You will pay me every month for the next six years, she continued, clearly resentful. We did not sleep in the same bed that night. The door remained securely locked. Time was running out. It appeared that she would soon file for divorce, and her fears about how to maintain herself and her lovers would become a painful reality. Leaving a dejected guy alone in his house for several hours each night is a tragedy waiting to happen. Eventually, I found a solution that works well for me. However, its success remained dubious. I realized I needed to take the chance. Waiting for the appropriate moment, luck benefited me. Robin just finished putting the kids to bed. She dropped a bombshell. I'm going out for the night. Do not wait for me. That was the catalyst. As she exited the kitchen and headed for the garage, I sprung into action. Straddling her, I quickly wrapped duct tape around her mouth to muffle any protest, binding her hands behind her back. Despite her protests, I was able to pack her into the trunk of her car while checking her phone. I learned she had been in touch with Spencer. I needed him to take the bait, so I composed a message on Robin's phone. I can't get you out of my mind. Want to go skinny dipping beneath the moonlight? 
The reply arrived in less than a minute. Sure. We're at Lake Moore along Highway 68 in Park, away from the lights on the northern edge. I get it. Be there in approximately half an hour. I retrieved the bag I had prepared from my own car. I tossed it in Robin's front seat. Concerns about leaving the children crossed my thoughts briefly, but not enough to discourage me. I arrived at Lake Moore in barely twenty minutes, dressed in a light aqua wig that matched Robin's typical look. I sat in the driver's seat with a handful of cinnamon powder in my palm. Spencer turned into the parking lot. He parked on the passenger side after exiting his car. He unlocked my front passenger door and leaned towards the car. He said, Hey, little lady, great idea. When he turned to face me, he saw I was pulling his hair with my right hand. I raised my left hand and blew cinnamon powder in his face. While he coughed and choked, I slammed his head against the dashboard with my right hand. I hurriedly got Spencer out of the car. Due to his bewilderment, the powder proved to be more effective than anticipated. In under 15 seconds, I taped his lips shut and bound his hands behind his back. I made cautious to always wear latex gloves to avoid leaving DNA traces. This is my warning to males who deceive other people's wives, I declared triumphantly. I did not injure him and only hit him a few times to get him to stop resisting. Understand who's in charge here. Although I may have been gentle with Robin, I'm prepared to go further if required. I stated it with an obvious look of dread on her face. Spencer nodded in agreement. I suppose that is an update for you. Spencer patiently waits for my return. I could have left him alone, but I am not that type of guy. Instead, I opened the trunk and noticed Robin's horrified expression. She looked like she belonged in a horror film. I'm wide-eyed and in tears. Come on, Robin, it isn't that horrible. Let me guess. We can work it out. You will give up, Spencer. It was only a fling. Do you genuinely love me? You never intended to hurt me. Robin nodded constantly, but I didn't believe anything she said. Sorry, sweetheart. Too little, too late. But do not worry. I am not going to kill you. You will come to your end. Naturally. Just so you know. Remember when you told Spencer you wanted to leave your husbands and be together forever? That's when you sealed your fate as a reckless cheater. Robin nodded slowly, agreeing. Two days later, he shot a video of Sandra in bed, enjoying her hobbies and cheating on her husband. You were only a passing romantic interest in him. It's almost hilarious how you think he was truly interested in you. Anyway, let us reconcile the two of you. Robin grunted and moaned, struggling in the trunk like a fish out of water. I pinched her nose and issued the same warning as Spencer. I set Robin down and closed the trunk of her vehicle as if I were pulling weights. I lifted Robin across my shoulder and began my 30-minute journey. After a little pause, I returned to Spencer's location using my map. 80 steps, then a right turn, followed by 164 steps and a left turn, and so on. 14 turns with no room for error. Robin covered me from the occasional rain just as doubt set in. There he was. Spencer made small sounds as my light approached cautiously. I seated Robin. Here you go, kids. You can spend your lives together now. Wasn't it your wish, Robin, to stay with Spencer forever? Dreams can come true. You see, I don't think you'll last more than a few days, but at least you will be together. There's no need for thanks. You are welcome. And no more creeping around. Do you remember what you called me, Robin? A helpless wimp. It's hard to think that hopeless wimp accomplished this, is not it? Their plaintive faces made me feel warm. I was confident that I could influence them to grant my every whim. There are no unmet wishes left in my thoughts. Now I'm finished with them. They crushed my emotions and transformed me into a monster who has no idea what he is doing. They can only blame themselves. You were both so smug when Robin duped me into eating your so-called pie. It was the final straw for me when I discovered how much you two laughed while discussing it. Thank you, Spencer, for capturing this moment. You saved me the cost of engaging a private investigator in the outside world. I still seem like a tolerant cuckold husband. Their tears could not move me. I dealt with them one by one. I needed to tweak their current image somewhat. For this, it was important to free them. But although Robin didn't resist much, Spencer, seeing that his grip had loosened, attempted to fall on me. However, when I had temporarily bewildered him, he surrendered to my machinations. And I completed the case. Robin, who was observing this, made no objections. Robin's remarks were difficult to hear, but they appeared to mean something like, I'm sorry, Ned. Please change your mind. My children depend on me. 
I promise to be a better spouse and never to betray you, and blah blah blah. Again, Robin, let me outline the circumstance for you. You and Spencer are currently deep in Sheldon's cave, roughly a thousand feet below ground. Bears reside in the cave, but rats are an imminent threat. As soon as you relieve yourself, the stench will draw them in, and they will begin chasing. At initially, only a few rats will detect you and alert the rest of their relatives. When they arrive in large numbers, your fate is sealed. You will have a difficult time. Do your utmost to ignore them. It will be easier to go past it. Believe me, I understand what I'm talking about. It was as if I had electrified them as they began attempting to escape my trap. Isn't it quite appropriate? You both behaved like filthy rodents against your spouses. You kept us in the dark, and now you'll spend your life in the dark. I took another bottle of water from the pocket of my cargo shorts and quickly emptied it. Holding these two cheats made me happy. You'll need water to survive. Simply dip your head into any of the reservoirs you come across. But be careful. Some of them are deep enough to trap you. There are no rough edges to grip onto, and the surfaces are so slippery that if you slide, you will never get out. Be cautious when making your way through the darkness, as the cliff can be hundreds of feet deep. If you make one wrong turn, you could find yourself 2,000 feet below the surface. Unlike you, I possess humanity, and all I'm doing is warning you so you can get out easily. However, I doubt that this information will be of much use to you, but I wanted to warn you that they were both weeping and breathing heavily. I had to tape their legs so that if something happened, they wouldn't try to run after me. Everything was done for safety purposes. Now I acknowledge that I had some inclinations that I was unaware of. I enjoy this predicament, but I will give you a chance to fight back. Usually these jokes do not include padlocks, but yours does. I do not want you to yell and draw attention. However, predators may arrive before people locate you. I am not that cruel, so I will free your hands before I depart. You'll need to work together to remove the remaining sticky tape that's keeping you down. It will be totally dark. Spencer has been here for more than an hour and is well aware of the situation. Robin, allow me to show. I turned off the miner's lantern. If you've never experienced complete darkness in a cave, you won't realize how confusing it is. Turning on the light again, I was relieved. Even though I knew the path out, it would be very hard to travel without the light. Do you still believe I will support your dirty lifestyle for the next six years? Your children will now have a mother other than you. I'd like to hear your final desires, but I really don't care. I hope you and your creator can synchronize your life decisions simply to ensure Spencer did not behave rashly with Robin. I chose to postpone their communication. That's how I feel about men who betray other men and sleep with other people's spouses. As males, all of our acts have consequences. If the other ten guys did nothing, the eleventh will do everything he can to exact retribution. Spencer tried to avoid my leg, but it didn't work, and I bewildered him again. After removing their hands from the duct tape, and while Spencer couldn't hear anything, I approached Robin and said, If you're lucky, you'll get out of this terrible place. Then I parked my automobile near the exit. It will provide everything you need to begin your life from scratch. I'm offering you a chance for redemption, but believe me, if you flee and run to the police, the consequences will be far worse. I hope you will make a reasonable decision, I said, and she waved her hand. I departed, of course, with no regrets. I could hear Robin's faint moans reverberating through the darkness. The following day, an anxious resident reported the appearance of the two automobiles, resulting in a thorough investigation. Despite being the seemingly disinterested spouse, I was summoned for questioning. My attorney steadfastly resisted the aggressive questioning, I remained mute in the face of the detective's questions, unable to provide an alibi for the night the unfaithful vanished. If the authorities thought they could incriminate me, they were welcome to try. However, they never succeeded. The case has remained as frigid as Robin's heart in her final months. No bodies were ever found. The sheriff secured a search warrant for my home, but they discovered nothing damning. I don't claim to have beaten the system, but they couldn't connect me to the case. Perhaps if they had dug up the skeletons, the outcome might have been different. I couldn't find peace of mind until I knew the truth, so I ordered for DNA tests for both children. They were definitely mine. Spencer's spouse received a couple DVDs shortly after he departed. She wanted information, 
so I convinced Paul to reproduce some of it. We were unable to proceed with divorces until a year had passed, after which we could petition for abandonment. We continued in touch, and our divorces were finalized on the same day. Although she couldn't receive the life insurance benefit until Spencer was officially confirmed deceased, she wasted no time in securing financial support for herself and her children. I felt truly thrilled for her. Trusting women has been a difficulty for me as each year goes without any significant connections. Several women attempted to put me to bed, but only the bravest were successful. However, none of our physical interactions resulted in long-lasting connections. I suppose I am afraid of revealing the horrific deed I committed if I become emotionally attached to someone, and I don't see any positive outcomes from that revelation. Much like the lyrics of that song, I am imprisoned in a solitary existence. My first choice for a nanny lasted two weeks. The second attempt resulted with me finding the ideal nanny who could stay with us indefinitely. Danny, who was only a day older than myself, rapidly bonded with the youngsters. Despite what my friends may think, our relationship is completely platonic. While she adores my children, she is as suspicious of men as I am of women. We compliment each other nicely. Eventually, when I could afford it, I bought a house. Danny moved in and now has her own bedroom, where she has lived ever since. I see her like a sister and she treats me as a brother. In an ideal system, fair administration would prevent instances like these from occurring. However, because the system is flawed, such events are unavoidable. I regained my composure. And one more thing. I have no idea if there is even a single rat in Elton's cave. I was only messing with their thoughts. I will apologize the next time I see them. I'd also like to mention that there were no bears in the cave. It was merely a normal cave, with the only danger coming from the terrified person's own thoughts. There were no cliffs or deep water. All they had to do was walk along the walls until they found a way out. I am not an actual monster. I simply wanted to teach those two deceivers a lesson. I had no idea if they got out of there or not. But do I feel remorse? Absolutely not. I feel not one ounce of guilt. If anything, I feel like I did less than I could have. Spencer was a true monster, forcing other men's wives to cheat on their husbands. I shudder at the thought of how many married women he had on his list. And it could have been. It's truly terrible. But what's even more frightening is that these women continue to live with their husbands as if nothing happened. They don't even suspect that their wives could be cheating on them and the children. What if they're not even theirs and they're living in complete ignorance? To me, that's the most horrifying and contemptible thing imaginable. And do I have the right to tell all those men whose wives I saw on the recordings? Would that be the right thing to do? On one hand, yes, I would help open the eyes of naive men. But on the other hand, I could destroy dozens of families. And who ultimately benefits from that? That's why I believe it's better not to meddle in other people's lives. But if anyone dares to interfere with mine, I will fight and go to the end. I won't tolerate humiliation. I could have come to terms with it if my wife had approached me and said she wanted a divorce, but under one condition. If she hadn't cheated on me behind my back. Of course I would have been shocked. I would have tried to work things out to win her back. I would have gone to counseling sessions and everything else. But if nothing helped, then I would have let her go. That's the most favorable scenario. When a person doesn't break their marital vows and only seek solace with someone else after the divorce is officially finalized. But how many cases like this do you know? Hundreds? Tens? They are few, and as sad as it may sound. Most spouses don't want to ruin their marriage, but still prefer to cheat on the side, and that's extremely unfortunate. Nevertheless, I believe that my ex-wife managed to escape, as I told her. And in that case, she either started a new life from scratch, or is plotting revenge against me along with her lover but that's unlikely. Judging by her frightened and bewildered face, she learned her lesson for life. At least I hope so. Here is the next story. What are the odds? I haven't seen or heard from her in ten years. Of course, that's because I disappeared and did everything I could to not be found by her. Her new husband and his family. I was pretty successful at it too. Yet there she was, standing in a booth at the expo for the same convention I was attending. She even walked right past me without even recognizing me. When that thought struck me, I began to form a plan. Yes, I can be a real a-hole at times. I should give you a bit of background here. You may also be wondering why my ex-wife's husband's family would be looking for me. 
it probably has something to do with the fact that they, at one time, were also my family. You see, her present husband is my biological older brother. Of course, his parents are my biological parents, as are his two younger sisters. When everything went wrong, I just walked away and started over. So, my name is Marvin Anderson. Marvin has been my name for the past ten years because it is my given middle name. And Anderson, because I looked up and noticed an Anderson window sticker while trying to come up with a suitable last name. The person I've been referring to is Beverly Curtis. In high school, she went by Beverly Stinson. Long-running high school romance here. Use your imagination. Yes. We were high school sweethearts. Yes. We surrendered each other our virginity after our senior prom. Yes. I was in love with her. Yes, she fell in love with me. Okay, fair enough, using my family's money. Too bad I didn't realize that at the time. Yes, my family had money. Mom and Dad owned a mid-sized manufacturing plant. We manufactured electronic components. We had some common components, but they were not our primary source of income. Seriously, the Chinese kicked us. However, their costs remained consistent with the Made in America guidelines. Our market consisted primarily of small-scale, high-value commodities. We designed and produced customized components to meet the needs of the customer. It turned out to be incredibly profitable. Okay, some information about my family. Of course, mom and dad were present. They started the business before I was born. Dad held a degree in electronic engineering. His best friend held a degree in manufacturing engineering. My great-grandpa on my father's side made a lot of money during the Depression by lending money to people who couldn't afford to buy houses and couldn't make the payments. He foreclosed on the land. He sold the same plot of land multiple times to various persons. Perhaps this explains where my family's significant lack of morals comes from. So, Brad is my older brother. I told you about mother and father. I also have twin sisters who are younger than me. Truthfully, they were the family's infants and only daughters. Yes, they were pampered. Their entire attitude on life was that if it didn't directly affect them, it didn't matter. They chose the option that had the fewest consequences for them. That surely explains how they acted when the excrement hit the fan. So many cliches. We were married shortly after our second year of college. We'd been married for five years when I arrived home early one day to find her in bed with my older brother. Long story short, I was only a stepping stone for her. Brad would eventually take over the family firm, while I would stay a glorified worker. Sure, I'd be officially second in command, but Brad would have all of the power, prestige, and social standing. Bev and I attended high school together. We started dating in our senior year. We both attended the local college. She became pregnant at the conclusion of our sophomore year, so we married over the summer. She dropped out to raise the kid, and I went on to finish my degree. My family was really helpful to us. We were both 20 years old when we married. When Ginny was two years old, Bev went to work as an administrative assistant at my family's business. They provided on-site daycare for their staff. I had to wonder how she became pregnant because we always used condoms. As far as I am aware, none have ever broken. She was not taking the tablet because she experienced an adverse reaction to it. So, crap happens. I did observe a couple of strange occurrences during the next five years. Twice, she experienced some unusual problem that kept us from having sex for nearly a week. I didn't think much of it at the moment. I wanted more children, but it hadn't happened yet. I hoped we would have a son this time. I loved my daughter, but every spouse wants at least one guy to carry on the family name. Yes, I hear you feminists out there saying that the woman can maintain her married name. I also hear you all yelling about how a parent can teach his daughter everything he can teach his boy. Yes, girls can be gearheads and enjoy muscle cars and racing just like boys. Yes, they can become mechanics, participate in all sports and activities. Again, it's one of those things hardwired into men's brains. They desire a son as an inheritance. Don't get me wrong. I adored my kid and was glad we had her. It would be the cherry on top to have a boy in the family. Our five-year anniversary was coming up at the end of this week. I had gotten her a lovely matching pair of earrings and necklace from a local jeweler. I snuck out of the office to pick it up and planned to hide it at home while Bev was still at work. We both worked at my family's business. They provided a daycare for employees, so she didn't have to worry about looking after our daughter. I took up the gift and dashed home. As I approached the house, I noticed Brad's car in the driveway. That was very bizarre. 
He was supposed to be at work and he had no business coming to my house at this time of day. I have a nasty feeling about this. I parked in the street two homes down and walked to the house. The door was unlocked. I silently followed the sounds into the master bedroom. Sure enough, Brad and Bev were having a great time. To this day, I'm not sure how I kept my fury under control. Regardless, I managed to record around five minutes of video before sneaking back out of the house. I had overheard some of their conversations. This sounded like something that had been going on for a few years. Despite my wrath, I realized I needed to take the time to gather all of the necessary information and devise a plan. Flying off the handle would just cost me more money and embarrassment. The divorce rules in this country harmed innocent husbands while rewarding dishonest wives. This was especially true when there was a child around. She'd receive the house and I'd get the mortgage. She would receive custody and child support. And I would miss visits. She would receive alimony, now known as spousal maintenance. And I would have the privilege of paying her to have sex with other guys in order to mitigate the damage. I had to keep this a secret until I was prepared to strike. And she would not receive the necklace I had just purchased for her. It took three months until I was ready. You may be expecting me to tell you all the ingenious ways I avoided having sex with the woman. And you'd be mistaken. She is a stunning woman with a terrific body. I drilled her as much as possible. Besides, I wasn't really risking contracting an illness. She only screwed my brother, not the entire town. The other issue was that if I tried to suddenly stop having sex, she would become suspicious. No, I gave an Emmy award-winning performance as the devoted husband and parent. Furthermore, I didn't want to pay someone I didn't know to get off. I hadn't mentioned it before, but I was the IT management of the company. It became clear that the rest of the family thought so little of me that they had never considered that small fact. My team was in charge of all the software, hardware, and programming on every computer and machine in the company. I had complete access to anything that required any type of computer code. I am the only one in the corporation with what I refer to as the God Codes. Those codes grant me unrestricted access to every machine the corporation possesses, including laptops, desktops, smartphones, C and C machines, and 3D printers. I even reprogram the coffee makers in the break room. Here's some advice if you're going to screw over the IT guy. Do not utilize business assets to discuss it. Five minutes after arriving at my workplace, I was reading all of their text messages and emails. Yes, I said everything there. I started with just beers and brats. I later discovered that my parents had also been aware of the situation. Mom even texted the twins about it, warning them not to tell me. Yes, my entire family was aware of my brother's infidelity against my wife, and they appeared to approve of it. You undoubtedly thought I was on the verge of breaking point. You would be right. I didn't see how things could get much worse. That's when things got increasingly worse. Jenny was not even my daughter. She was Brad's daughter. Those two events I recounted earlier kept us from having sex for a long. Abortions. She underwent two abortions since I was the biological father. She had Brad's baby, but she aborted both of my children. They had to pay. They had to pay a lot. The more I learned, the more I planned. Never meddle with the IT man. You might be wondering why. I know I was. It turns out that it was simply greed. Brad was being prepared to take over the corporation. I never intended to be more than a stockholder a minor one at that, and continued to lead it. They were planning to drag me along as long as they could before Bev filed for divorce so she could marry Brad. His income would much exceed mine. Why are we waiting? It's simple. They required me to keep the machinery running until they could find someone to replace me, if necessary. Sure, they hoped I would simply accept the situation and stay. However, they also requested a backup plan in case I left. Besides, I was parenting their child and helping Beth, so Brad had less to pay out. He could improve his finances to better care for his wife and child later. They also intended to keep Jenny's true parenthood a secret from me, leaving me liable for massive child support payments for the following three months. I started progressively moving money from our investment accounts to a new account in the Cayman Islands. I convinced Bev to take out a second mortgage on the house to build a large swimming pool and entertainment space in the backyard. Of course, she agreed that it would allow her and Brad to do more entertaining and I would be responsible for the cost. The loan took a full month to process. I also kept that money in an offshore account. 
I'd bring home some designs approximately every two weeks to show her I was working on them. I created the designs myself while I was supposed to be working. I also posted a notice on an online website saying we were accepting bids on the work. We ended up interviewing five different contractors. I hired a private investigator to install hidden cameras throughout the house while Bev was at work. They were high definition and included audio recordings. Everything was recorded on a cloud server that only I, the private investigator, and my divorce lawyer had access to. I continued to copy all of their emails and texts. I also printed real copies and stored them in a new safety deposit box I'd acquired at a different bank under a new name, Marvin Anderson. I am not a stupid person. I knew when the excrement hit the fan, every one of them would be furious beyond belief. They would launch a harassment campaign and attempt to recuperate the cost of the damage. I was about to unleash. I made a few online social media profiles. I also made a phony website that said Marvin Anderson was an extremely wealthy entrepreneur. He held an MBA and two bachelor's degrees, one in business administration and the other in international finance. Neither would stand up to serious investigation, but that wasn't really necessary at this stage. Forged documents are also rather simple to obtain if you know where to seek. It merely takes an official-looking photo or a bogus information name. Address and other information obtained via the dark web, along with the transfer of a small sum of money. About two weeks later, you receive an anonymous package at your office. Never meddle with the IT man. Oh yeah, yeah. You cannot simply believe the words of liars and cheaters. I had a DNA test as well. I swabbed Jenny's cheek while she was asleep. After swabbing my own cheek, I managed to extract Brad's DNA from a glass he had used at a party. I sealed everything up and sent it off. I used my company's email to retrieve the findings. After all, I was the only person in the organization who had access to anyone else's email, and I was looking forward to them discovering that email after I departed, and they launched their own inquiry. Okay, you can pretty much figure out that I was planning to burn Bev during the divorce. You can also tell that Brad was going to be slightly singed, not a roast. Brad with the rest of his family. Brad wasn't going to be too tough. Brad was a bully who also acted arrogantly. All I needed to do was allow him to be himself. He took over the corporation. He'd drive it into the ground. It is. Ineptitude would ensure the company's downfall within a few years. Not only would the company go bankrupt, but he would be shunned in the industry for wrecking a highly profitable enterprise. I believed I could help him out in that quest. First and foremost, I believed that the family owed me for what they were doing and intended to do to me. I did what I always do. Fake accounts. Fake invoices. A few lines of code in the finance programs. Nothing too noticeable, but enough to hurt when they found out. It was also large enough to provide me with financial stability for an extended period of time if necessary. Marvin Anderson was about to become rather wealthy. The next step was to build and program the bomb's timer. This took me a week to build. No, it wasn't a real bomb that would cause physical damage and injuries. I am a computer programmer, not a criminal. It was a software bomb. It would generate devastation only in terms of the company's finances and efficiency. It was programmed to go off in a specific set of circumstances. I could set it off with a command or when specific pre-programmed events occurred. It would cause every computer and smartphone in the entire organization to crash at the same time. Every computer control system would abruptly stop working or worse, go wild. I had a particular plan in place for those who went haywire. These were the CMC and milling machines. Finally, the day arrived. I realized I probably should have done things differently. It would probably have been better or at least safer if I had not been present. My presence provided them the opportunity to physically confront me. That was a drawback. It implied that they could physically restrain me and intimidate me. Yes, that was a bit silly of me. Regardless, a train disaster is fascinating. There's a reason why people can't look away when one is going to happen. It is almost unheard of to receive enough advance notice of one to plan on being present and viewing it. I just couldn't resist. Also, I had a strategy to distract them long enough to make my escape if necessary. It wasn't necessary. I was in the main foyer of the offices when I noticed her stroll in. She was in her mid-twenties and dressed professionally. I have to say, she was stunning. She was carrying a briefcase with three manila envelopes tucked under her arm. That was the signal for me to start smiling. 
I entered my father's office. What is this? He inquired as I tossed a sealed envelope over his desk. Instead of responding, I raised my hand with all five fingers wide. Five, four, three, two, and one. I counted as I lowered my fingers one by one throughout the countdown. No. A loud, wailing howl could be heard from the outside. Five more fingers were held up, followed by another countdown. What the hell? A male voice was heard yelling. One final countdown. The blonde bombshell appeared at my father's doorway. Mr. Nathan Curtis? She asked with a Georgia drawl that sounded like peaches and honey. He said, Yes, I am. She handed him the final envelope and added, Y'all have been served. Have a lovely day. She snapped a brief photo of him holding the envelope before heading out the door. That should clarify everything. I laughed and swiftly left before anyone could regain their composure and make my leaving difficult. The letter I left on my father's desk was my immediate resignation, alleging a hostile work environment. This was based on the company's management and owners supporting and encouraging the sexual relationship between the company's president and one of its manager's wives. Of course, Bev received divorce papers, and Brad was served with a lawsuit for creating a hostile workplace and alienation of affection. I was also suing him for back and future child support. I took all of my personal belongings from my office a few days ago. I also quietly withdrew anything I desired from our home. All financial matters have been handled as well. Bev received the house as part of the divorce settlement, and I had depleted the majority of the savings account. My lawyer had power of attorney, which allowed her to act on my behalf even while I was not there. When the door closed behind me, Michael Curtis died and Marvin Anderson awoke. It was the last time I saw any of them. For the next ten years, counseling was ordered. My lawyer had no idea where I was, and I wasn't informing her the case had been dropped. I was ordered to pay child support. My lawyer had all of the evidence that she was not my child, and that they had purposefully misled me about this truth. My countersuit against Brad for child support was successfully resolved. She applied for alimony. I was no longer employed, and she was suddenly earning more than I was. My lawyer politely declined any alimony payments from her. Regarding the house, my lawyer prepared a quit-claim claim and informed her that she may have it. The remaining assets were provided to her. Brad had moved in before the week was done. I'd relocated to the West Coast, so, as is typical, the alienation of affections litigation was unsuccessful. Brad did not need to pay me many hundred thousand dollars for creating a hostile work environment. He was the boss, and screwing an employee's wife did not sit well with the judge. The company settled for approximately $2 million after evidence revealed that they were aware of and actively encouraged the affair. Between the litigation, the money I skimmed, and the investments and savings I withdrew, I ended up with little over $4 million. Yes, she should have received half of the savings and investments, but good luck locating me or the money. I waited about six months after all of the lawsuits were resolved before detonating the bomb. It fried the servers and rewrote the entire code for the CNC devices. Financial data was lost and the machines began producing things that were out of specification. It took two weeks to have everything fixed. That was two weeks of no production. That disrupted a lot of the schedule and costs, resulting in multiple missed deadlines. I ended up starting my own ITA consultancy company. To avoid having my name associated with it, I formed an offshore LLC. Two years after leaving, I became reasonably prosperous. I was engaged in a car accident. It need fairly substantial facial reconstruction surgery. I decided to take advantage of this and modify a few aspects that I disliked. I always believed my nose was too huge, so I tried to make it smaller. My chin was little weak, so I got it repaired. I only made a few minor changes because I was always self-conscious about my chin. I have kept a goatee since I was 18 years old. Now that my chin had been reshaped, I began shaving smooth with only a few minor changes. I looked completely different than I had previously. The trucking firm that owned the rig that collided with me was paying for it nevertheless. Another change was that I was in much better physical shape. I was always physically fit, but not terribly so. Sure, I went to the gym a few times a week, but they weren't really strenuous workouts. It was basically to keep me from becoming soft. Following the accident, I had to go through some quite tough physical treatment, which got me into the habit of working out more. Yes, it sucked at first, but I quickly realized that it made me feel a lot better. 
I started to notice that I was looking better as well, before my stomach was flat. It now has a clearly defined hard six-pack. As I gained muscle, my chest, legs, and arms grew in size. I transformed from an average thin office worker to a muscular, confident man. Yes, it was completely their fault. The driver was speeding, had driven for too long that day, had faked his logbook, and the truck was not properly maintained. Following that, I became the company's owner. I promptly implemented new safety measures and fired five drivers. The company's reputation increased, and we started obtaining more business. First, I needed to meet with the NTSB regulators and discuss my improvement plan. I keep them updated. Once the insurance company discovered what I was doing, insurance rates fell as well. My new policies spread quickly and the company's reputation improved considerably. We delivered on schedule and safely. I hired a couple of new mechanics and ensured that all trucks and trailers were properly maintained. So, between my consulting firm, the trucking company, and a slew of good investments, I was doing extremely well. I looked across the room at my ex-wife for the first time in ten years. The old feelings of betrayal and rage resurfaced. Sure, I got rid of them all, but they never faced consequences for what they did to me. I never got any serious retribution against any of them. That was when an awful plot began to emerge in my mind. I would pay them back in the same way that they deceived me. It was clear that Bev had not recognized me. She walked right past me, looked straight at me, and smiled. It was one of those smiles that ladies give to males they are interested in. It wasn't really flirtatious. She is probably unconsciously informing him that she thinks him appealing. This was going to be entertaining. I recognized her flaws and intentions. It was simply a matter of placing the appropriate bait on the hook. I had the exact bait I needed for this. Suddenly I had a thought. I brought out my phone to verify the date. Yep, perfect. My plans have broadened to involve much more destruction. I only had to convince her that it was safe. I walked up to the booth she was at. I had no use for whatever her company offered, but she didn't have to know. I began gazing at the pamphlets on the table, pretending to be interested. Have you got any questions concerning our products or services? A feminine voice inquired. Pretend you're seeing her for the first time, I responded. Actually, I have a few questions, but I'm sorry I don't have enough time right now to adequately gather all of the information I'd like. I'm interested in a handful of products and anticipate needing a substantial quantity of each. Unfortunately, I'm on my way to a meeting right now. Okay, can you restart later? Unfortunately, I won't be available until about 7 o'clock this evening. I believe that is when the expo will close tonight. Tell me what. Here is my card. I'm basically going to be hanging out in my hotel this evening, so give me a call and I'll meet you somewhere and answer all your questions. Yep. The possibility of placing a large order piqued her interest. Now get her to bite. How about this? I'll make a dinner reservation at Mario's at 7 o'clock. It's right within the hotel, and I've heard it's one of the top Italian restaurants in the area. You can meet me there for supper and we can talk about what your company has to offer. She deliberately looked down at her left hand. I added... You can even bring your husband along. After all, this is a business dinner. And here's my card. My name is Marvin Anderson. I own Mac Industries LLC and have other businesses that could benefit from several of your items. Her smile grew larger. She probably knew nothing about me, but she was quite familiar with Mac Industries LLC. I could almost see her eyes leaping out of her head in the form of cash signs. She then took more than a passing glance at the fitted Armani suit I was wearing. That would be excellent. It will only be me, though. My hubby could not make it this time. That is okay. Would you like to invite any of your colleagues to join us as well? As if she wasn't going to share the commission with anyone else. Unfortunately, all will be unavailable. It will be just me. I'm confident that I can answer all of your inquiries. I offered her a bright smile and walked across the room to the exit. No, I did not have a meeting to attend. I returned to my suite. Of course. I was in a penthouse apartment, preparing for my revenge after showering, shaving, and getting ready. I changed into another Armani suit because wearing the one I had on earlier would have revealed that I was not as wealthy as I needed to be when I arrived at the restaurant foyer. I noticed Bev was already there. She had clearly gone all out to impress her. The LBD was low-cut with a high hemline. She was standing in five-inch cuffs and I was wondering if she was wearing thigh highs, stockings, or a garter belt. 
The plunging neckline revealed that she had not worn a bra, and I couldn't see any panty lines where the tight dress contoured to her beautiful hips. Forget about dangling the bait in front of her. She allowed me to hand-feed it directly into her mouth. This was supposed to be so simple. It was nearly dull. Okay, so she did answer all of my questions at supper. She also stated why her product was better than the competition's. We talked about expenses and quantity. I made the usual sounds about being impressed and promising to call her when we were ready to place the order. I couldn't place the order this week since we were still figuring out how large the order would be, how many of each would go to which location, and a few other details. Whatever order we placed would arrive within the next two weeks. Little did she know that I had no need for any of her items, and even if I had, I would not buy them from her company. Instead, I would approach her largest competitor. I suggested that because it was still early, we should go to the nightclub next door for a drink or two. She was more than willing to comply. I'm very sure she used the time she was getting ready for dinner to check up my details on the internet. The way she grabbed my arm and molded herself to me when we danced would demonstrate to her that I was as wealthy as I appeared. I couldn't help but wonder if she was considering trading up again. After a few beers and a few dances, we arrived in my suite. She wasn't intoxicated. She understood exactly what she was doing. She was the one to suggest it. Yeah, I could see cash signs flashing in her eyes. And I found while we were sitting in the club that she was not wearing panties. As I stroked my hand up her thigh, she simply smiled and spread her legs wider without protesting. An invitation. I am not on the pill. She huffed as I kissed and nibbled at her neck and earlobe. Don't worry, I was clipped. I am allergic to latex, thus I cannot use condoms. I responded. I'd love it. She smiled. She definitely should have thought about it more, but I was doing everything I could to distract her. We played three rounds that night. The next day, she transferred her belongings into my suite. We had sex every night. So, is there a Mrs. Anderson fiancé or girlfriend? She inquired on the final morning of the conference. I was wondering if she would ever inquire about it. It was clear that my left hand was unadorned. Now maybe I can have some more fun with this. Nope. I was married for a few years before we split up. We just drifted away. We married too young and eventually divorced. I haven't discovered anyone else yet, but I continue to look. I'm thinking it's time to settle down now. Well, I would love to see you again. I'm growing quite drawn to you. It's not just that you're an excellent lover. I also like our chats and simply being with you. How about your husband? You being married may present problems if we start dating full-time. We're actually just roommates right now. We do not even sleep in the same room. I can't even remember the last time we had sex, before I can begin putting any serious effort into a relationship. I need to deal with various business difficulties. I'll be doing a lot of traveling during the next few months. I will contact you once I am finished, if you are still available after two additional rounds of sex. We cleaned, packed, and checked out of the hotel. She went her way and I went mine with the pledge to stay in touch. I ripped up her business card and threw it away as I prepared to board the airline the following Monday. I contacted the security firm that I had on retainer. They were supposed to keep a tight eye on Bev and my old family for at least the next few months. Contrary to what she had told me, she and her husband were more than just roommates. The security service was able to install covert cameras and microphones inside the house. They had intercourse on average three to four times every week. Oh yeah, yeah. It was unlawful as hell. But this security company was quite effective at gathering information. I didn't care about the majority of what they did, but I needed certain specific information. One thing I discovered was that, shockingly, Brad was absolutely committed to Beth. At least he was now. I can't say for certain about the prior ten years. He also wanted another child preferably a boy. I also learned that they had a routine for the night prior. Either one of them needed to travel. They both tried to wear the other out through sex. That made me smile. It was two months later that I received the final piece of news that I had hoped for. I watched the camera feeds as she prepared the living room for Brad's arrival home from work. I watched the reveal as Brad walked through the door. Congratulations, Dad. You were able to knock me up again. He was stunned. Then they were overjoyed. How far along are you? He asked. About two months. You must have done it either the night before. I had to leave for a week-long conference in Las Vegas or it was the night I returned. 
Apparently, she still believed that I was shooting blanks. She called and left a message, tearfully informing me that she and her husband had reconciled. She wouldn't be able to leave with me now. That gave me a good chuckle. After that, I had the security company remove all the cameras and stop watching them. I could get the rest of the information on my own. I set a reminder on my Outlook calendar for a couple of months down the line. It was just about dead on nine months after the conference. I was checking the birth announcements in my hometown. There was a picture of Bev holding a newborn baby boy with a smiling Brad looking over her shoulder. I had completed the changeover in management of all my companies, and I was now looking at the picture over the internet from my hacienda on Costa Rica. No, I wasn't going to stay holed up here forever. It was just one of the places around the world that I owned. Besides, I was no longer Marvin Anderson. Good luck finding him. Besides, he wouldn't matter anymore. They would soon figure out that was just an alias. Anyway, time to finish my revenge. I switched over to a new Gmail account I had set up just for this. Now let's quickly see the story from the eyes of Beverly Curtis. It was two weeks since little Marvin was born. I'm still not completely sure how I managed to convince Brad to name him that. No. I was under no illusions that Marv was actually the father. Marv had a vasectomy and was shooting blanks. He even showed me the medical report he had done. Brad had managed to knock me up the night before I flew to the conference or the night I got back home. I simply wanted to name him Marvin to secretly remind me of the fantastic week I had. My husband was ecstatic that we finally had a son. At first, he's been acting a bit weird since a couple of days after the birth. I'm not sure what's going on, but something just isn't right. I had just put the baby down for a nap. Jenny was in her room, probably texting with her friends. I was just about to start making dinner when the front door suddenly slammed open. You cheating? Which Brad yelled at me. How many times have you cheated on me? I was shocked. I mean, there was no way that he could have found out about Las Vegas. Okay, sure. I had started thinking about trying to snag Marv. Brad did have a lot of money, but Marv was a whole lot wealthier. Then, when I found out that Brad and I were going to have another baby, I just couldn't leave Brad. What are you talking about, Brad? I've never cheated on you. Seriously, it's been over nine months since that conference in Vegas. There's no possible way he could have found out. At least there could not possibly be any proof. Now, he threw an envelope at me. It was at that point that I noticed his parents and the twin sisters had followed him into the house. I managed to just barely catch the envelope before it fell to the floor. Who the hell is he? Brad. I don't have the slightest idea what you are talking about. About two weeks ago, I got an email with a link to a website showing a shitload of videos of you screwing some strange guy while you were at the conference in Las Vegas nine months ago. It also suggested that I get a DNA test done on the baby. It said that there would be a couple surprises in there. One big surprise is that I'm not the biological father. He took several deep breaths, then continued. I want to know who Marvin, my real father, is. I was shocked. Brad is his real father. That's when I opened the envelope. It was the result of a DNA test. It said that Brad was not the father. Well, actually, it said that there was only about a 40% chance that he was the father. Marvin carried some of the DNA Brad carried, but there was some other DNA that neither of us possessed. Look, Brad, it shows that you and Marvin carry the same DNA. No, it says that he carries only some of the same DNA. At best, it says that I would be in. He stopped speaking and got a really strange look on his face. My God, Michael, that scream came from my mother-in-law. No, it couldn't be. Sure, there might have been a very slight resemblance, but Marv couldn't be Michael. DNA doesn't lie. Brad was definitely not the father, but he was a close relative of the real father. There were no other male relatives except Brad's father, close enough to be a match, and I had to finish or not had sex with my father-in-law. Marv was the only other man I'd slept with, and I realized that week was my fertile time. I was absolutely shocked. Suddenly, I began thinking Michael was a genius with computers. How hard would it have been for him to fake a medical document like that? Then I remembered those two abortions where I took care of the two times that I had accidentally gotten pregnant by Michael. I had purposely avoided having any children from him. Now, in the irony of all ironies, I just had his son. I had cuffed Michael with his brother. I had now accidentally cut bread with Michael. He knew, he knew, 
and he did it on purpose. I screamed out, what are you talking about? Nathan asked. I didn't recognize him. He looked completely different than he did 10 years ago. I'm sure he recognized me, though. He knew all the right buttons to push. He knew exactly what he was doing. He seduced me. He told me that he had a vasectomy. He even showed me medical report. My cycle is as regular as clockwork. He must have remembered that I would be at my peak fertility that week. Oh my God, he must have remembered that I had those two abortions and purposely avoided having his children. Well, screw him. He sued me for Jenny's child support. So now I'm going to sue him for his own child support. Much as Michael Curtis had disappeared before, Marvin Anderson no longer existed. Brad's attempted child support suit. When exactly? Nowhere. You can't sue someone that doesn't exist. Brad and Bev ended up staying together. He would be on the hook for child support for both Jenny and Marvin until they graduated from college. He would also have to pay child support, spousal support, mortgage on the house, and at least half of all their assets. It was cheaper to keep her. They stayed together, but their relationship was permanently destroyed. Now they were living in a loveless marriage and simply became roommates with benefits. They still had sex occasionally, but it was just sex. There was no more making love. Now it was simply two people relieving their urges. They sold the house and quietly split up as soon as Marvin left for college. Don't worry about little Marvin, sure. He was not the offspring of the favored brother, but he was still a cute, happy baby. His grandparents still spoiled him and his mother still had her maternal instincts. The decision was made to never let anyone know about his true parentage. Besides, Brad always did want a son. They never did have any more children. As for me, I did end up getting married again. We have three children, one boy and two girls. I do it on them constantly, every once in a while. I do think about my other son out there. Yes, it would be nice to visit with him and have him in my life, but that is simply not a possibility. Perhaps after he turns 18, I might see about quietly reaching out to him. When I finally die, he will be in for a shock. He is included in my will. As for my parents, I sent them four anonymous emails. The first one told them that I got married. Obviously, they were not at the wedding and they never got to meet their new daughter-in-law. The other three emails were to tell them about the birth of their grandchildren that they would never see. That was my punishment for them. I hear that they have spent a fortune on private investigators looking for me and my children. Good luck with that. So you probably think I am really whole for what I did. I won't really argue with you on that. Just keep in mind what they did to me. I think I deserved a little payback. My brother cooked me, so I turned it around and cooked him. She purposefully refused to have my children when we were married, preferring to have my brother father, her daughter. So I tricked her into having my son while she was married to my brother. I think that's justice. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for taking time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to tell about your or someone else's circumstance, please don't hesitate to contact me. Take care.